The following program deals with controversial subjects. The theories expressed are not the only possible interpretation. The viewer is invited to make a judgment based on all available information. Tonight on Sightings, these people claim to have had close encounters of the fifth kind. This is a new chapter in interspecies communication. Then, don't make any plans for the new year until you've watched our full astrological report with startling predictions for 1993. It's the worst period that I've seen in a long time. Welcome to Sightings. I'm Tim White. The start of every new year means resolutions that we're determined to keep, and probably don't. And of course a chance for psychics and astrologers to make their predictions for the coming year. How accurate are these prophecies? And should we believe these predictions about the future? Well, perhaps this year we should pay special attention. Many professional psychics are predicting a 1993 filled with disaster. We believe that at 705 in the evening on the 8th of may 1993 there will be one of the largest earthquakes ever to hit california that it will spread um during an 11 minute period when the the, the quake will actually continue all the way up the coast on this uh, on the andreas fault and that it will start uh, a, a major disaster on the american continent a frightening prediction and one made even more astounding when we consider the source. A 16th century physician, astrologer, and to some, a visionary, by the name of Michel Nostradamus. According to some scholars, Nostradamus's predictions about major historical events have proven to be amazingly accurate, even 400 years after his death. Nostradamus was the most extraordinary man of his century. He was known in many circles, known as medical circles, court circles, Many ambassadors used to write terrified letters back to their various kings and queens saying, Monsieur Le Nostradamus has said so and so. We must be careful. For centuries, people have tried to decode his cryptic writings. He has been credited with predicting the coming of Hitler, air travel, great natural disasters, and plagues. Now, there have been many interpreters of Nostradamus, but Nostradamus wrote in very obscure quatrains. First of all, it's hard to interpret it we find out that you can read anything in it you want to. A new and intriguing interpretation of the quatrains of Nostradamus is being offered by author Peter Laurie. What we did in our book was actually to discover a code, a numerical and a grammatical code, which actually is tricky to begin with, but once you get the hang of it, it's quite simple, which decodes the quatrains and makes them much more fascinating than they are, in fact, on the face of it. Nostradamus often used astrology as what he believed was a scientific backup to his predictions. Astrology is based on the belief that the relative positions of stars and planets have a direct effect on all life on Earth. But can the future really be predicted with any accuracy? Many people do believe that psychics, palm readers, and especially astrologers have a special ability to see into the future. And there are those who turn to countless books and magazines that offer advice and predictions for the coming year. Astrology is both an art and a science. It's a science in the sense that we use the actual positions of the planets. In fact, my computers here have the same uh, planet position tapes uh, from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratories in Pasadena. The art end of it comes from being able to interpret these planetary positions and what they mean for a person uh, in their life, in their future, what's happening for them. Computers are the latest weapon in a high-tech arsenal astrologers are using. The positions of the stars and planets for any period of time can be entered and then quickly compared to important information about a single individual, a group, or even a specific geographical region. One of the tips that led me to the realization 
uh, that there was a strong potential for a moderate to severe earthquake in California the end of June 1992 uh, was the position of Jupiter, the most massive planet that there is, uh, was sitting at the midnight point below the state of California at the time that the uh, biggest earthquake in 40 years hit the Yucca Valley area. In addition to charting the likelihood of catastrophic events and providing individual charts for their clients, some astrologers are also helping some businesses find their way to economic prosperity. I do a uh, portfolio called a company profile and I uh, take the incorporation date of the uh, business and uh, run it, of course, on the computer. And all of those charts give some insight into the business. As a result of working with Grace, I saw a tremendous turnaround in the income and the volume of activity in my business. Arch Crawford is Wall Street's best-known astrologer. His newsletter was calculated most accurate by Timer Digest for 1991 and 2. I was looking for something, you know, in Wall Street just to give a slight edge. And what I found was startlingly more than an edge. The new incoming administration would do well to consult astrologers. Uh, the heads of most governments in the past always did uh, consult astrologers. Uh, some of the major heads today still do. Ronald Reagan was known as the Teflon president because whatever they threw at him, it, nothing stuck. And the reason he, it, nothing stuck was that he was doing everything on a favorable astrological time. The man knew what he was doing. I can tell you that Bush has not been using astrologers because he went uh, to Japan and threw up on the prime minister on an eclipse date that was in bad aspect to the NATO United States chart. That was the worst time to go out. It's, that was a good time to stay home and be sick, maybe. <laughs> and what do the heavens tell prominent astrologers and astroeconomists about the events of the upcoming year? Looking over what's going to happen in the year ahead, it looks to me like one of those years they're going to make t-shirts about. It's going to be, I survived 1993. The major war potential now relates more to the holy war between the Islamic nations of the Middle East uh, and the great powers in the West. It's going to be more of uh, a terrorist kind of situation, especially around approximately February 2 and also in August and early October of 1993. We're going to have another major uh, seismic upheaval uh, in the western U.S., probably California, uh, probably around February the 8th, uh, March the 6th, April the 6th. Those three dates are key dates, uh, plus or minus three days. I do have a prediction of a high late in April and a very devastating May-June period. It may be another crash. It's the worst period that I've seen in a long time. I don't know specifically how the planets affect the uh, Somalia in particular, but I think it's very strange that the United States goes in there on the day of the lunar eclipse. And I don't think that that's a good thing on a full moon and, and a lunar eclipse is, is not a good time to start projects. Nostradamus predicts an earthquake on the west shore, Los Angeles, California, which really is such great dimensions that the seismic records will be heard not only in New York but practically worldwide. He gives us May the 21st. Is this our fate, or are these predictions merely random guesses based on an unproved science? And should we take them seriously? Can computers or the words of a 16th century doctor foretell our future? We all, of course, want to know what's happening in the future. I think that's something we experience as a child. If we could just predict the future and know what was going on, nobody can do it. And the, the, the promise of it, I think, is so compelling and so strong that it takes an act of will and a lot of effort to overcome the natural inclination to want to believe that, too. For now, only time will tell if it is the astrologers or the skeptics who will be right in the future. Joining us now with more predictions of what lies ahead in 1993 is Jean Avery, world-famous astrologer, lecturer, and author of numerous books on astrology. Jean, welcome to Sightings. Hi, Tim. Thank you. Many of the astrologers that we've spoken to, Jean, say 1993 is going to be a simply awful year. Do you agree? Well, it's not going to be an easy one, let's put it that way. Why? 
There's an aspect in the skies between Uranus and Neptune that is so extraordinary it has not been around for 165 years. The planet Uranus always describes events that are almost catastrophic. I have to say that word. Gene, people love lists. What are your top three predictions for 1993? Do I have to confine them to three? Sure. I see the stock market starting to get into trouble February, March. I see May bringing earth changes, perhaps, in Seattle area. I see catastrophic events with the stock market at that time and some terrible rumblings in the Middle Eastern countries again. Other astrologers have predicted a major earthquake in California. Another one in 1993. May the 8th, some of them say. How about you? Well, I see earth changes up around Seattle and Utah and or in Portland. I don't see it in lower California. Earthquakes Not north of California? Earth changes. What does that mean? Floods, hurricanes, disastrous weather conditions, but not necessarily the earthquake in California. What does President Clinton have ahead of him, according to the stars? Well, he has a fabulous time ahead. He's going to be a wonderful president. Uh, I feel even inspired. He has four years ahead with very few difficult aspects. So I think he's going to be a fabulous leader. Gene Avery, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. And we will be back with more sightings in just a moment. Coming up next, these people claim to have had close encounters of the fifth kind with extraterrestrials. This is a new chapter in interspecies communication. Until recently, sightings of UFOs have been divided into three categories. A close encounter of the first kind, or CE1 for short, describes sightings closer than 500 feet. A CE2 includes physical evidence left behind. And the third kind, or CE3, describes face-to-face -face encounters. A few years ago, ufologists added CE4 to describe reported alien abductions of humans. And now there's a new category, Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind, CE5, in which humans and aliens actively communicate with each other through light and sound. The Center for the Study of Extraterrestrial Life, or CSETI, is pioneering the study of CE5s. Dr. Stephen Greer is CSETI's director. A close encounter of the fifth kind is uh, a term that we have coined to describe humans deliberately attempting to vector a spacecraft into an area with the intention of interacting with it. Most encounters um, in all the other categories are passive. In a CE5, we take the initiative to communicate in some fashion, whether it be with sound or light or thought, to try and get a response rather than just being passive observers. We want to interact. And some of these are sometimes quite serendipitous. For example, an individual might be out uh, at night driving along a highway and see an extraterrestrial spacecraft or a UFO and will take the initiative uh, to uh, get a flashlight and begin to signal to it. And many times it will come over and then signal back. The purpose of our work is for peaceful communication, uh, mutual respect. We absolutely assume non-hostility on the part of any visitors until it's proven to us beyond a shadow of a doubt. In their field research, CSETI has developed a specific set of protocols for initiating contact with alien spacecraft. Their goal is a successful CE-5. The different methods of initiating a CE-5 include using sound, which are at this point we're using uh, anomalous sounds that were recorded inside of crop circles in England. We use light. When we go out into the field, we go with um, half million candle power halogen lights that are portable. The lights are used for signaling to the UFO, either in a series of flashes or by drawing shapes in the sky, usually a large triangle or large circle. It's meant to encourage the UFO to p participate and to interact with the project. We also use thought in the form of uh, meditative thought or thought projection. We call it coherent thought sequencing. So we are using these, uh, what we call the contact trilogy, in a protocol fashion with the express intention of a boarding party, a C-SETI trained boarding party, going on board and having a meeting with these visitors. In the spring of 1992, Dr. Greer took a CSETI group to one UFO hotspot, Gulf Breeze, Florida. 
This computer simulation is based on CSETI's own footage, supposedly showing communication with a UFO. We began signaling to them with these lights, and they would signal back so that we would flash to them two flashes and off, and they would flash back two times and off. They uh, disappeared briefly, and during that time period, we were making a equilateral triangle in the sky with these high-powered lights. At that point, shortly after we did that, they reappeared in a perfect equilateral triangle. Over 40 people uh, witnessed a definite close encounter of the fifth kind between the C-SETI group and uh, these UFOs. With their apparent success at Gulf Breeze, C-SETI expanded their field research to include an investigation in Great Britain. They combined forces with British researchers who were interested in investigating if alien spacecraft could be responsible for England's famous crop circles. We wanted to try and prove once and for all if a link really did exist between the UFO phenomenon and the crop circle phenomenon. We picked the Wiltshire area because the majority of the crop circle formations in England are forming in that particular county. The site there uh, is very close to Stonehenge. Uh, it's a very prolific area for aerial phenomena and for the ground patterns. During our protocol that evening of July 23rd, we focused on our thought process for this particular formation for 20 minutes. We all held in our minds the thought of a triangle with a circle at each point of the triangle. And we were, of course, very astonished to find that the next day, precisely that shape appeared in a field we walked out onto the end of this long land formation, and as we got to the very end, there glistening in the sun below us was the perfect formation identical to what we had envisioned. We clearly do have a, an intelligence involved, which is, it would appear to be reading the brain patterns of uh, the human psyche. It seems very evident to us that this is all about communication. They, wh whoever they are, are communicating to us with these ciphers in the field. And in our CSETI protocol, we've communicated with them and they've answered back. When we saw the existence of this formation, we considered that to be a very high level CE5. Exhilarated by their success, the CSETI team mounted another investigation nearby at Alton Barnes. Bad weather forced most of the team to abandon the overnight surveillance. But Dr. Greer and three others persevered. At approximately 12.20 a.m., Chris Mansell was banging on my window, and I opened the door, and I said, what is wrong? And he said, there is a spaceship coming right through the bloody field. It must have been 80 to 100 feet across, very large. And at this point, we were able to extricate one of these high-powered lights, and we began to signal to it. So I took the light, and I hit it twice with this very high-powered light, two flashes, and paused. To my ultimate surprise, it actually flashed back. <laughs> and uh, he did it again, and it flashed back again. It's, it's just amazing, I mean, uncanny, really. This event certainly ranks as one of the most significant human-initiated encounters in history, and I think it speaks to the uh, possibilities which await us in the future. One such possibility is accurately predicting when and where a CE-5 will occur. Roy Dutton is a British aerospace engineer who has amassed records on thousands of reported UFO sightings. Given a specific location, Dutton believes he can predict the date and time of the area's next sighting. I can very, very quickly produce a predictions graph for any place on Earth. Roy Dutton did predict the events that occurred at Halton Barnes. I had just met him that day, the day of the 26th, and he had, uh, for that part of England, had stated that there would be high likelihood of sightings at around uh, 10.30, which is when we did have the first sightings, and then again at 12.30. The sightings which occurred that night were congruent with his predictions. We, in our CSETI work, have communicated to them, and they've answered, well, what are the boundaries of this? This is a new chapter in interspecies communication. CSETI members believe that the increasing number of UFO sightings reported over the past 40 years are more than coincidence. They believe the growing number of sightings are part of an extraterrestrial master plan to prepare us, they say, for formal contact in the near future. Coming up, a landmark that's become the site of an investigation after a psychic channeling.
Robert the pirate spoke through me, and he spoke about underground tunnels and buried treasure. Up and down the eastern seaboard, local folklore is filled with stories and legends about the pirates who once ruled the Atlantic coast. Their exploits on the high seas are intriguing, but still more tantalizing are the stories of buried treasure the pirates left behind. Now historians, archaeologists, and a psychic are teaming up to find one treasure trove that they all believe may lie buried in New Jersey. One of the most notorious pirates in North America was Captain Charles Morgan, who ruled the waters off the coast of New Jersey in the mid-1600s. Many believe that he lived here at an historic site now known as Spy House, so named because of the British spies who were imprisoned here during the American Revolution. Three years ago, local psychic Jane Doherty visited Spy House to investigate eyewitness reports of paranormal activity. As I came through the house, I picked up various information, went into a trance, and Robert the pirate spoke through me. At first, we didn't know his name. He just, just came out of me, and he spoke about underground tunnels and buried treasure. Uh, when I came out of the trance, we were all very shocked by it. Even more shocking was confirmation by geophysicist Bruce Bevan that tunnels did indeed exist beneath Spy House. I detected three lines of echoes out on the other yard of the house. These are caused by objects which are underground and we might say follow their path for a length of maybe about 20 to 30 feet or so. The possibility of tunnels under Spy House does not surprise local historians. When pirates came into shore, what they would do is they would go to the center of the harbor, and then it was believed that they would use the tunnels to bring in goods and to bring in slaves. So there's a very good chance that some of these tunnels are still in existence. In the spring of 1993, scientists from Rutgers University will begin an investigation to determine if there are tunnels beneath Spy House. Sightings will bring you the outcome of the Rutgers investigation. If you've had a paranormal experience, our investigative team would like to know. At 1-900-740-SIGHT. Each call 75 cents a minute. Average call lasts two minutes and you must be 18 years or older. Again, the sightings hotline is 1-900-740-7483. On the next sightings, how do Russian psychics cure diseases and find missing bodies? An exclusive report reveals their secrets. Then, is voodoo magic really sinister? The word voodoo actually means holy or sacred. On the next sightings. Join us next time for new investigations into the unexplained. For Sightings, I'm Tim White. Catch the television debut of X-Men. America's most popular comic heroes come to television in a special one-hour premiere tomorrow morning on Fox. And all new Likely Suspects is next.